Road to IELTS, the IELTS Preparation and Practice Solution, brought to you by Knowledge Island by Bilal. Please change the volume using the bar in the top right corner. Click continue when you hear the sound clearly. Before we continue. Please subscribe to our channel, and press the bell icon to get more updates. You will hear a number of different recordings, and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions, and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four parts. Now, turn to part one. Part 1. You will hear a telephone conversation between a person who is inquiring about a job and an employee of a company. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 4. Hello, Freshopolis Supermarket. How can I help? Oh, hello. I'm just calling about the job I saw advertised on your website. Oh, yes. We still have positions available. That's great. I'd like to ask about what's involved exactly. The website didn't have many details. No, we use the same general advert for all the jobs here at Freshopolis. So, what would you like to know? Well, what exactly would I be doing? Would I be a cashier? No, I'm afraid all our cashier positions are taken at the moment. You would be stacking shelves. Oh, that's fine. Of course, if a position on the checkouts opens up in the future, you could apply to transfer there, but at first, you'd be on the shop floor. OK. And would I be helping with deliveries too? No, we have a special team for that. There are a lot of health and safety roles. Right. And this is a part-time position, yeah? Yes. Most of the workers here are students, so most of our positions are part-time. You would start with 12 hours a week. That sounds fine. Would that be one day a week, then? No, you do it across four days. Oh, OK. So each shift would be three hours. Is that right? That's right. And the days you work change each week, so some weeks you'll do weekday evenings, other weeks you'll do Saturday mornings, for example. I have university on Monday and Tuesday mornings. Would that be a problem? Nope, not at all. The job can fit around your studies. Just tell your manager if there are any shifts you can't do. Like I said, most of our workers are students, so we understand your studies come first. Fantastic. And which branch would I be working in? The town centre one? No, we have no vacancies there. We're looking for staff for the branch on Geranium Road. I'm not sure I know that street. How do you spell it? G-E-R-A-N-I-U-M Road. Got it. Uh, wait, is that the road with Worldview Cinema on it? Yes, that's right. In fact, the branch is just opposite the cinema. Oh, I do know it then. It's actually quite close to me. Could I ask about the wages? Of course. Your starting rate will be £10.30 an hour. That's pretty good. I know cost drop supermarkets only pay £8.80 per hour. 
Yes, we try to offer a competitive rate to attract the best workers. We also increase your rate if you're working on a Sunday or a public holiday. It goes up to £11.95. That's great. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you will have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. We like to think so. We also offer a few other benefits for all our staff members too. For example, with your staff discount, you'll get 20% off anything you buy from our store. That's good. And if you ever work a double shift, you'll be given a free meal, either lunch or dinner, depending on the time of your shift. Wonderful. Do I just choose free food from the supermarket shelves? No, it'll be in our staff canteen, so it'll be freshly cooked. And hot. That all sounds really good. Yes, our cook is really talented. The food is delicious. We also help with your travel costs. If you take the bus to work, we have a bus voucher scheme. You can use these vouchers to get lower prices to and from work. I usually get around the city by bike. In that case, you'd benefit from our work cycle scheme. You can get money off in lots of different bike shops in the city. That would be really useful if I needed new tyres or something. Yes, it's a great little scheme. Well, you sound pretty interested. Would you be able to come in for an interview? Sure. When would it be? We're holding interviews next Tuesday to Thursday. That's the 13th to the 15th of February. Are you available on any of those days? Tuesday would be the best for me. I'm visiting my family for a couple of days from Wednesday. That's great. Could you come in the morning, say, 11 a.m.? Could we make it after 1 p.m.? I have university in the morning. Sure, no problem. Is 2.30 okay? Perfect. I just need to take your name. Of course. It's Jesse Flynn. Okay, Jesse. We'll see you then. Make sure you bring a hard copy of your CV when you come to the interview. As we're seeing so many candidates, we're asking you not to email it in advance because it can go astray. No problem. And where will the interview be? At the branch, or...? Ah, yes, sorry, good point. All the interviews take place at our head office, which is next to the town centre branch. It's the next building. You can't miss it. There's a sign outside that says, Freshopolis Office. That sounds easy enough. And when you come, give your name at reception and say you have an interview with Alex White. Alex White. Got it. Yes, that's W-H-Y-T-E, by the way, not I. Sure, great. Well, thanks very much, Jesse, and we'll see you next week. Looking forward to it. That is the end of part one. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. Part 2. You will hear an information announcement on a ferry. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. Hello and welcome aboard the Malmo Seafarer. 
My name's Sam, and I'll be your head of hospitality during your voyage. First, let me give you details of some of the facilities we have on board. We're currently standing in the foot passenger main entrance on the blue deck. If you're feeling hungry, you can go up the stairs to the red deck, where you'll find the restaurant directly above us. Meal times are very busy, so to avoid the queues, we recommend that you reserve a table at reception, which is on this deck, just along from the main entrance. For those of you looking for some entertainment while you're on board, we'll be screening a variety of films throughout the voyage. Our 60-seater cinema is on the green deck on the opposite side of the ship to the cabins. If you need to keep the kids entertained, then feel free to drop them off at our kids' play area, which is just down the stairs from the bar. The area comes equipped with an indoor playground and an arcade with all the latest video games. Shopaholics should check out our shop zone, which is just next door to where we are now, towards the bow of the ship. Everything on sale is duty-free. Anyone wanting to relax should head to the top level of the boat, where you can find our open-air sun lounge just next to the bar. Don't worry if the sun hides away during our journey. There are lots of heaters to keep you warm when it's chilly. Towards the stern on this deck, you'll find the observation platform, a great place to take in the stunning views during our journey. However, make sure you wrap up in a warm coat as it can get pretty windy on a day like today. And there's no heating on the platform. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. Okay, so let me give you some details of our voyage. The journey will be approximately 11 hours long. We'll be leaving the port of Malmo at 10 a.m. and we're scheduled to reach our destination of Rostock at 9 in the evening. For those of you continuing your travels by train, You'll have plenty of time to make your connection as the trains from Rostock run until 12 a.m. or midnight. If you want to avoid the queues at the train station, you can buy your tickets in advance from the information desk here at the main entrance. All passengers on the Malmo Seafarer can get train tickets for 10% off. If you're planning to take the bus from Rostock Port instead of the train, you can also get a discount on tickets. We don't sell bus tickets on board. But if you show your seafarer boarding pass to the driver when you get on the bus in Rostock, you'll be able to pay a reduced fare. There are also lots of other services available here from the information desk. If you'd like to book one of our cabins for the duration of the voyage, or if you'd like to upgrade a standard cabin to a first-class one, come and speak to us. You can also book a guided tour of the ferry for just seven euros ninety nine and pick up a map of Rostock and the surrounding area free of charge. For those of you who need to check your email or work remotely during our journey, the cabins have a Wi Fi connection that you can log into. Alternatively, feel free to make use of our communal office space on the same deck, where there are desks available for all passengers. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Part 3. You will hear a conversation between two university students about an upcoming presentation on private space travel. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Right, so we really need to start planning our presentation on private space travel. It's in two weeks. I know. The time's really flown by. How did you find researching the topic? A lot more difficult than I was expecting. How about you? Yeah, me too, to be honest. But I watched a show online the other week that was actually really informative. I saw that. It was good, wasn't it? It had some interesting background information, but I'm not sure we can use that much in the actual presentation. Yeah, you're right. What did you find helpful for your research? Did you find any good books? Well, the most useful thing for me was that time we went to speak to that engineer from A-Space. I must have listened to that recording of our conversation about a dozen times. That was great, wasn't it? When I started doing the research, I tried to use my notes from Dr. Waltz's lessons to put a plan together, but then I realised he mostly talked about state-run spaceflight, not private. So they didn't really help me that much. Me neither. Something I found pretty tough was condensing what I'd found out. I mean, there's such a wealth of information out there if you look for it, but paring it down was pretty tricky. I know what you mean. It was good that we had a really clear focus from the start. I think that really helped, but yeah, there's so much information to wade through. What did you make of Cosmos Dollars by Professor Andrea Wilmington? That's the book Dr. Waltz recommended, isn't it? Personally, I didn't like it at all. Really? Do you mean the way it's written? It's very conversational. No, I didn't mind that. I just felt it was all a bit superficial, you know? It didn't look past the surface level of the topic. I think you're right. I also felt her research projects were too general. I didn't really feel like I learned that much from them at all. Hmm. Anyway, I feel like I've got enough for us to get started now. What about you? Same. So how should we do this presentation then? The usual way with slides and pictures? I think we should do something a little different. First, I think we should start with a video. I have a clip from that online show we could use. That sounds great. And after we've begun the presentation with that, I think we should just deliver it to the class without slides or anything. Do you think that's a good idea? People like to have something to look at during a presentation. I know what you mean, but I think this way, the audience can just concentrate on us and what we're saying, rather than simply reading whatever's on the slides. I see where you're coming from. Perhaps to make them really focus on us, we could tell them not to make notes. We could give them a piece of paper with the key facts and our bibliography on at the end. But for the duration of our presentation, just keep the focus on us. Exactly. I think that's a great idea. It'll definitely be different from the other students. I'm sure they'll remember ours. I hope so. But I think the best thing about doing it this way is that we can connect to everyone in the audience. Yes, that's key. We want everyone to be able to follow it and get something out of it. Definitely. We can still get deep into the topic, but I think we should try to make it feel like a conversation with a friend. I think that's a really good idea. Well, that's that agreed then. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30.
Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. I think it makes sense to begin our presentation chronologically, don't you? Give the history. Sure. So I guess we'd be starting in the 1950s? Only for the very beginning. I mean, at that time, there were very few private entities involved in space exploration. It was basically nations and specifically the U.S. and Russia. I think you're right in the case of Russia, but weren't there quite a lot of private companies involved in the U.S. space program? Of course, you're right. NASA used a lot of different businesses as contractors, making different pieces of equipment for their rockets. Were any involved in the design process too? No, I don't think they were the designers of anything. I think NASA kept that in-house. Anyway, we don't need to spend too long on that bit, I think. The real involvement of the private sector came with satellites. Yes, for communications. It was in the early 60s that the U.S. allowed anyone to operate satellites. And soon there was a vast network of them up in space, which we take for granted today. We should stress that although they were privately owned, governments were still in charge of getting them up into space. There weren't any private launches until quite a few years later. What was the first company to do that then? Uh, a few different companies were setting things up at the same time, so it's not a clear-cut answer. Most agree that Ariana Space was the first. I didn't realize Ariana Space was private. I thought it was part of the French government space agency. Close. It was set up by the European Space Programme, and a lot of the initial funding did come from the French government. But shortly after it was set up, it became a private company. Oh, okay. Do we want to say much about Ariana Space in the presentation? No, I think it's just good background information. The bulk of our presentation should really focus on the early 21st century. That's when private spaceflight really started heating up. I agree. I think we should give an overview of the main private spaceflight companies. Me too. And I think we should focus on SpaceX, Blue Origin and Virgin Galactic. I think they show different sides of private spaceflight, but have some commonalities that mean we can link from one to the other. Oh yeah? How do you mean? Well, all three were set up by billionaire entrepreneurs who are often in the media and often seen as quite charismatic people. I see. So SpaceX was set up by Elon Musk, right? Yeah. And Blue Origin is Jeff Bezos's company. And they both made their fortunes from the internet. Wasn't it shopping online specifically? For Jeff Bezos, yes, but not so much for Elon Musk. What links them is their use of the web to become some of the richest people in the world. Right, got you. What about Virgin Galactic? Richard Branson's in charge of that, right? He was rich before the internet was even around. Yeah, so he doesn't have that connection. However, both his company and Jeff Bezos's company focus on developing suborbital space tourism whereas Elon Musk's SpaceX has other priorities. SpaceX are all about getting people into space and putting a man back on the moon, right? Well, Elon Musk's ultimate goal is getting to Mars, but yes, SpaceX have a lot of contracts with NASA and have transported astronauts to the International Space Station. Wasn't Jeff Bezos' company also after a NASA contract? <laughs> That's right. There was a contract to develop a moon lander that both Jeff Bezos's Blue Origin and Elon Musk's SpaceX bid for. SpaceX was ultimately successful in that one. I didn't know that. So it seems like we can give an overview of the three companies and link from one to the other quite nicely. I think so. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Part 4. You will hear a lecture about nuclear power. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Welcome, everybody. Now, in our last lecture, we covered the basics of nuclear fission. So, today, we will look at how that is achieved in nuclear power plants and discuss some of the benefits and risks associated with nuclear power. In a fission reactor, nuclear fuel reacts and causes nuclear fission. The fuel will be a uranium or plutonium isotope and is held in rods. Neutrons fly out of these rods and cause nuclear fission in other rods. Between the nuclear fuel rods, there are a series of control rods. These can be lowered to stop neutrons traveling between the fuel rods. By raising or lowering the control rods, you control the speed of the reaction. As I'm sure you all know, controlling the reaction is key. A fission reactor that is not controlled is essentially an atomic bomb. The fuel rods sit in a moderator. This may be a core of graphite. The purpose of the moderator is to slow the neutrons down, which increases the chance of them being absorbed by a nearby fuel rod and causing nuclear fission. At the bottom of the reactor, low temperature coolant enters the reactor. The energy from the fission reactions in the fuel rods heats up the coolant, which exits the reactor at the top. The heated coolant is then used to boil water, which drives turbines in the power station and generates electricity. The byproducts of fission reaction give off significant amounts of radiation and are extremely hazardous. To mitigate this, the reactor is encased in concrete, a material widely used for radiation shielding. So, let's move on to looking at the pros and cons of using nuclear fission to produce electricity. We're going to begin with the cons, as most people are much more familiar with those than with the pros. And that, in itself, is the first drawback of nuclear power. It has far from a stellar reputation. The majority of people hold an extremely negative view of nuclear power, rightly or wrongly, so building a nuclear power plant will always meet with fierce resistance. On top of all the other complexities of setting up a nuclear power plant, one has to deal with the populace that does not want it built at all, or at least nowhere near them. You don't need to be a rocket scientist, or, indeed, a nuclear scientist, to understand where this feeling comes from. Nuclear accidents. Nuclear accidents can utterly devastate the surrounding area. Radiation is lethal, can be far-reaching, and unimaginably long-lasting. Perhaps the most famous nuclear accident was the meltdown at Chernobyl. Now, that happened in 1986. Any ideas when the area around the power plant will be safe again? I'll tell you, in the year 21986. For 20,000 years, that area will be uninhabitable. Can you imagine? And the death toll for Chernobyl is estimated at around 1 million. So, these accidents are absolutely catastrophic. But radiation isn't only caused by accidents. All nuclear power plants produce nuclear waste, which gives off lethal radiation. This waste often remains deadly for 200,000 years. Managing this waste is expensive, and humanity has yet to come up with a method of disposal that is safe for this length of time. Speaking of costs, just building a nuclear power station is extremely expensive, much more so than other types of power station. And once a power station has come to the end of its life, you can't just knock it down, as you would other buildings. The station must go through a process of decommissioning in order to make it safe. This is also extremely costly. Another criticism leveled at nuclear power is its inability to adjust to changing power demands. A nuclear power station can produce a steady amount of power, but should there be a surge in demand, it is slow to meet that increase. There are many more disadvantages to using nuclear power, of course, but I think those are enough for now. And make no mistake, each one of these are serious issues. So why would anyone in their right mind support nuclear power with such significant drawbacks? The answer may surprise you. 
nuclear power is green. Yes, that's right. Providing no accidents occur and the waste is well managed, nuclear power is environmentally friendly. Generating electricity from nuclear fission produces no pollution and doesn't contribute to global warming. What's more, because nuclear fission requires very little fuel, there are far fewer mines destroying the environment for raw materials, and far fewer polluting trucks on the roads transporting it. This also makes the fuel cheap, another benefit of nuclear power. And, although, as I mentioned before, the cost of building power stations are high, the plants themselves last a very long time, longer than other types of power stations, and are relatively cheap to operate during that time. The final benefit I'd like to talk about is how nuclear power stations impact other scientific areas. Nuclear power plants are at the cutting edge of scientific research and are replete with the latest technology. The breakthroughs made in developing nuclear power stations don't only benefit the nuclear industry. This technology often ends up helping a surprising number of disparate industries. So, do the benefits outweigh the drawbacks? Well, that's for you to decide in your essay. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the listening test. Don't forget to comment, like, and share our video.